Hello everyone, welcome to Hot Seat. I'm Omid Magadas from Tehran, and once again, I'm so honored and happy to be with you all from this educational platform. And I have to say, uh, having great names and educators, researchers from around the world accepting this invitation, I always say it in all of my sessions, is a huge honor and I think it's a great opportunity for all of us as dentists to be from, to be educated from this platform during, especially in this period of time that we, most of us, don't go to offices and it's a good time for be, become more updated and to see beautiful cases by best practitioners around the world. And today, I have a very dear friend and a special guest, Roberto Rossi is here with us from Italy. Hello, Roberto, welcome to Hot Seat. Hello, Amir, how are you? Everything okay, thanks. Thanks for your kind invitation. I'm very happy to spend this hour with you and I hope uh, it will be useful for you and for the friends uh, watching this uh, webinar later. Thank you so much for your time. And today's topic is one of, the, one of the special topics that we didn't have any sessions like that before. And I think it's one of the most demanding topics for every practitioners, especially who are focused on aesthetic zone. So the topic that we will have discussion and a great presentation today about it is the role of periodontist in creating a beautiful smile diagnosis and treatment of altered passive eruption, a multidisciplinary approach. I'm very excited even now that we haven't started, so I'm pretty sure you will enjoy the topic, hearing it from the master himself. So as a tradition, I will have a brief CV of Roberto for all of you, and then I won't ma make you wait much longer, and we will go to the presentation, and at the end, we will have a brief discussion on the topic. Uh, Roberto graduated in dentistry in 1987 the University of Genova. He started his career as a periodontist in 1989 at Boston University. He specialized in 1991 and received his MSc in Perio in 1992. He returned to Italy where he established his practices in Genova and Castel Monferrato limited to Perio implants and aesthetic dentistry. From 1994, has done researches in the field of guided tissue regeneration and guided bone regeneration. Has been professor at postgraduate level in master courses in several universities, Genova, Padova, Chieti, Roma, Pisa, Madrid, Granda, and Manila. Because of his passion for aesthetic dentistry, he has become a certified member of the European Society of Cosmetic Dentistry and of the Italian Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry, where he sits on the BOD. He is an international member of American Academy of Periodontology, certified member of the Italian Society of Periodontology, and fellows and follows actively the proceedings of the Italian Academy of Osseointegration. He is an honorary member of the Bohemian Society of Implantology, founder, active member, and vice president of Bone Biomaterials and Beyond Academy. He has been board member, cultural secretary, and member of the Boston University Italian Alumni Association for 20 years, author and co-author of 40 publications on peer-reviewed magazines of the chapter on periodontal regeneration of the book Bone Biomaterials and Beyond, and lectured to more than 300 national and international meetings since 2000. Again, with that said, it's my honor to invite Roberto Rossi on hot seat. And Roberto, the stage is all yours, the platform of these educational uh, webinars, and we are ready for your beautiful presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we will share the screen now. So now, now we can restart, I think. Yes. Okay, there we go. Okay, so basically uh, in periodontics, uh, uh, what we do in the new millennium is what we have done uh, all along. So we do infection control, pocket reduction, regenerative therapy. But I think the increased uh, demand for aesthetic therapy is uh, something that we, we find every day in every clinics uh, everywhere around the world. 
And as a periodontist, uh, I have often to deal with uh, patients like this, where aesthetic uh, is not uh, really the concern, but uh, trying to save, uh, to savage teeth on, on severely peri periodontally involved patients. And most of times, it's not just the periodontal therapy, it's the combination of periodontics and prosthetics that lead to a good or reasonable aesthetic result. And we very well know that dentistry is the art of restoring the smile when we have patients of a certain age with the black triangles in the aesthetic zone. The goal of our therapy is to change completely the aesthetic, the color, the shape of the teeth and the soft tissue and to re-establish a beautiful smile. And this is uh, what we do ordinarily with prosthetic dentistry. I'm very lucky because uh, I have in the office uh, a very good office partners, and one of them, Alessandro Conti, is, uh, is a superstar, is a young, uh, very talented prosthodontist and prosthetic dentist. And obviously, laminates uh, are the treatment of choice. Uh, this is a patient uh, we treated about 10 years ago. And this is the aesthetic result we achieved by, by doing a, a prosthetic uh, rehabilitation. The integration between the, between the white and the pink aesthetic uh, give us a, a wonderful uh, improvement of, of a smile that was not uh, exactly pretty, but uh, after the treatment uh, has become a very natural, beautiful white and pink uh, uh, coordination of colors and smile from the right, from the left. And 10 years after, you can see that the 10 year follow up shows that everything is very nice and stable. So, stability is also another important key of the game. When we do this kind of uh, solutions, we want them to last uh, for as long as it's possible. Another situation we have a, a tooth that uh, is uh, dyschromic, is uh, uh, in a position that is not exactly what the patient wants. So, uh, we create a new laminate that. Uh, completely changes uh, the aesthetic of this patient. Uh, and in this, day, in this time with Beppe Romeo, that is one of the most uh, uh, acclaimed uh, dental technicians in Italy, we changed uh, the smile of this patient. But we know that uh, beauty uh, resides uh, in nature. So uh, the nature is beautiful uh, 360 days in the year. So it's beautiful in the summer, in the winter, in the fall, and uh, <coughs> in spring. So why not uh, to have to do anything that is uh, related to prosthetics? So when we have patients that uh, have a, a condition that is called ultra passive eruption, basically we have a situation where at the time of eruption, uh, there is an improper relationship between the soft tissue, the hard tissue and the tooth. So the gums, uh, the bone uh, and the tooth are not in the, in the ideal position. Actually, when we look uh, at uh, smiles uh, these are all uh, very nice beautiful healthy young people but if we focus uh, very carefully on their smile there's something that is not uh, proper and this uh, improper thing is that they show too much ginger there is a, a very uh, strong or incorrect balance between the white and the pink aesthetic this condition was uh, well described by three professors of the UPenn, the University of Pennsylvania in 1977. I had a very uh, fortunate uh, opportunity to meet all of three of them because uh, when I started my, my career as a periodontist, I spent one year in uh, Philadelphia. I studied English, so I was going uh, every morning to UPenn and I had the chance to meet Costler, uh, Van Arsdal and Weisgold. And they basically describe the two different types of uh, ultra passive eruption, type one and type two. In type one, we have the gingival margin that is coronal to the cemental amelie junction. And in the type two, the gingiva is exactly at uh, the uh, gingival margin. Well, let's look at it because uh, in type one, uh, what we can see is the, uh, a situation that uh, for a dentist uh, would actually look normal. For a periodontist, uh, we can clearly see uh, that it's not exactly perfect because the texture of the gingiva is not uh, what's supposed to be. The color has a strange blanching. And if we look at the length of the lateral incisors, one is longer and the other one is shorter. So what do we do? We take x-rays. We can see that uh, under the gums, there is a certain amount of enamel that was completely covered by gingiva that seems a little bit unhealthy, but it's just because uh, there is an uh, improper attachment to the tooth. 
So this is uh, uh, the natural tooth. So what's better than to expose the natural beauty? We don't have to do any, any kind of restorative uh, treatment to these patients because we simply expose something that the natural uh, was hiding. Well, in time margin is located uh, exactly at the CJ. So this patient seems to be uh, a normal and healthy patient. But once we look at the radiographs, we can see that there are no black triangles in the interproximal spaces. So we can make a very uh, quick strike and diagnose this. This is a case of alter passive eruption. Now, the point is that uh, once this patient uh, stops uh, uh, doing uh, proper oral hygiene uh, maneuvers, this is the situation. Looks so terrible. Actually, this is before when the patient came in, was in this situation, and the dentist referred it because he was afraid that this patient had leukemia or some systemic disease. Well, no systemic disease, no leukemia. No, no, nothing that is uh, uh, threatening the health of the patient. It's just uh, alter passive eruption. So once we perform oral hygiene, everything goes back to normal. Well, we have two subtypes that are related to the type one. So when the gingiva exceeds uh, the enamel of the tooth, we can have uh, a subtype A, where the bone crest is located at the proper distance from the cement enamel juncture. So we have actually the normal biological wind. So we go back to the patient we have seen before. We do the gingivectomy. We raise the flap. And when we raise the flap, you can really see that we have the biologic width in this case. So the distance between the cement enamel junction and the bone crest is one to three millimeters. Well, in this situation, we will see later, uh, uh, we did not have a way to diagnose cases like this before because we did not have the CBCT. Now that we have CBCTs, that will ease the diagnosis and it's even the treatment plan for patients that have a subtype A. Well, in subtype B, uh, we have a completely different situation. In subtype B, uh, first of all, uh, we have a, a, a display that you can see the gingiva as different shades of pink. So in one of the publications, we described uh, this uh, condition as the rainbow smile because it really looks like a rainbow. You can see that the color of gingiva at the close to what's supposed to be the CJ is reddish, then become, becomes whiter, and then becomes red again. So it looks like a, a rainbow. And this makes a very easy diagnosis for subtype B. In subtype B, as you can see, the bone crest is very, very close to the cement enamel junction. Sometimes it's actually on top of the cement enamel junction. So basically, these patients don't have a biologic width because there is no connective tissue attachment on top of the root surface. So we have to recreate this anatomical condition by doing a crown lengthening, by doing an osseous resective surgery and creating the proper biological width. Well, let's talk about uh, uh, now the prevalence. Uh, we are quite lucky as dentists because uh, uh, the alter passive eruption only hits a uh, young adult male in 7%. So there, are, there is a higher percentage of female patients uh, with this condition. And of course, ladies always want to have a pretty smile, so they are looking for the periodontist, they're looking for the dentist to take care of this condition. But sometimes uh, uh, we have uh, uh, an in-between situation, so when it's not just uh, the work of the periodontist, but the work of the periodontist interfaces with the work of the prosthodontist and the dental technician. Nowadays, we are very lucky because by doing a digital dentistry, we can do a digital smile design on these patients. We can do a mock-up and a pre-visualization that will enhance the possibility for the patient to accept this kind of treatment and to go for the therapy. Well, you can see that uh, in this case, uh, the patient was a model, was referred to the office uh, by the photographer that uh, was complaining that her smile was not uh, as pretty as she was. She needed uh, to have a prettier smile to look better in pictures. And once we took uh, the full mouth exercise, we could see straight forward that uh, the patient had alter passive eruption. <clears throat> so basically, what do we do in a case like this? It's quite simple. Uh, we take uh, into our picture. You can see that one of the features of patients uh, with ultra passive rapture to show short, uh, square, and quite in naturally short teeth. So basically, uh, we take the pictures of the smile, then we take the face picture, then we go through the process of digital smile design. 
I'm very happy that uh, I can share my practice with Alessandro Conti. Alessandro is a young superstar, and by doing uh, the digital smile design together with our dental technician, David Bertazzo, we created uh, a, a WhatsApp that uh, was based on the DSD. The DSD is uh, done uh, together with the patient, uh, choosing a shape uh, of the teeth that will probably most likely like uh, the patient. And in this case, we can see that we need to do a crown lengthening, not only on the uh, bone size, but all, also on the tooth size. So we have to lengthen the tooth both in the apical and in the coronal position. So what do we do? We uh, print uh, this mock-up uh, in the mouth of the patient. The patient uh, looks uh, in the mirror. We take videos. Uh, we do we test uh, the phonetic, we test uh, the aesthetic, and if the patient accepts, uh, we go for the crown lengthening procedure. So we put uh, the mock-up in the mouth, uh, we do the scalloping of the gingiva, we expose the bone crest, it's a subtype B, you can see that there is a very limited biological width. So we create, uh, with the periodontal probe, uh, a distance between the CJ and the bone of about uh, three millimeters, which is uh, actually a good average. Then after uh, the soft tissue heal, now we have a stable soft tissue situation and we can start working on the teeth. So we perform a second wax up. In the second wax up, uh, we print it in the mouth of the patient and we can actually play a video. And in the video, uh, we'll test uh, uh, the aesthetic of the case, the phonetic again. And the patient, you can see, is quite happy because it seems like uh, it's a completely different uh, situation. Looks very natural because now the length, especially in the soft tissue aspect, is the final length. So once uh, we have the full acceptance of the patient, we can move forward. And in this case, we can jump on the final restoration. So uh, Alessandro uh, prepares, uh, uh, David prepares uh, the laminates uh, for Alessandro, and Alessandro does uh, the bonding using the rubber dam. And uh, at the end of the procedure, you can see that uh, we have a completely different smile because the teeth are not anymore flat. We have waves, we have up and downs, we have volumes that make this smile much more alive than what it was when it started. So this was the beginning of uh, our story. And this is actually the new smile from the right and from the left. And when we can see it framed in also nice and beautiful lips with some gloss, it looks like a masterpiece, a work of art, <laughs> basically. So the extra oral evaluation uh, is also very, very nice. And uh, actually, when uh, we completed this case and, and the first time that the patient did the first uh, service uh, after the treatment was complete, she sent uh, us uh, the pictures from the magazine and uh, a big, uh, a big thank you to the office and all the staff that worked in making a smile beautiful. But when we deal uh, with the uh, normal patients, so there's no just uh, plain uh, periodontal uh, concern. Well, Irina uh, is a good uh, family friend. Uh, she is from Cuba. And you can see that uh, in her gummy smile, there is also some little pigmentation because probably uh, the South American, the Latino blood carries some melanin in the gums. So she's not happy to display this uh, gingival display plus uh, the, the coloration of the gums. So basically, uh, when we study these cases, we take uh, very strictly, there is a protocol. So we take uh, intraoral pictures. The intraoral picture has to be always in the same position with the rest position, with the smile that we, is what we define as a natural smile. And with the four smiles. So we tell patient, smile as you would be very, very happy. So show us all the gingiva and all the then what we do is uh, we take uh, the uh, intraoral uh, uh, radiographs with a rinsentrator. So we try to make a parallel uh, technique. So we want to exactly have the measurement uh, of the anatomical and the radiographical feature of the teeth. So now we can actually do uh, a simulation because if the tooth uh, is longer, uh, with Keynote, we try to lengthen uh, artificially the tooth because the tooth is eight millimeter, but in reality, when we look at the, the uh, when we look at the, the clinical aspect, is only eight. So we have to scallop uh, this tooth by three millimeters. 
And actually, when we do then the real surgery, we remove uh, the, the gums and we can see that uh, we find the perfect correspondence, correspondence between uh, the, the measurements that we did in the radiograph and what we see actually in the clinical uh, aspect. Well, we are very lucky that uh, we have instruments uh, that uh, can help us to make uh, correct uh, evaluations uh, for this condition. And uh, Stephen Chu, a professor of uh, NYU, uh, designed this uh, for you 3 d these uh, instruments that are called uh, the aesthetic gauges. Uh, they are used to evaluate uh, the mesiodistal and the, the um, uh, incisal uh, coronal aspect of the teeth in, in, in terms of aesthetics. They're uh, designed to define uh, the crown lengthening and to define the biological width. As you can see in the left side, uh, basically, uh, when the tooth fits within uh, the red margins, the natural aesthetic length of the tooth in the apicocoronal aspect should fit within the red mark. So we know how much we have to scallop our gingiva in order to give this tooth a proper aesthetic. Then with the second probe, we can see that if the tooth is that long, we will need to remove the bone up to the red mark in this case. And of course, with the, with the chew probe uh, for the biologic width, we can also establish if there was already biologic width or not. So uh, we measure, then we measure the clinical length of the tooth. We measure again the radiological length of our tooth, and then we are ready to make uh, our treatment. Well, there was not much uh, literature about uh, uh, the treatment of alter passive eruption after 1977. Only Garber and Salam in 1996 uh, gave uh, indications. Uh, so in alter passive eruption uh, uh, type 1 subtype A, we will do a simple gingivectomy, so a very simple treatment. While in alter passive eruption uh, uh, type 1 subtype B, we will need to do flap uh, with osseous resective surgery. It's a quietly quite a little more complicated procedure because you need to know how to perform osseous resective surgery. Well, basically, uh, as I said before, uh, nowadays we are very lucky because uh, technology is improving and it's giving us a, a lot of tools that we did not have in the past. One of those is the CBCT. With CBCT, we can see on the left side of the screen a patient that shows gingival inflammation because of alter passive eruption. And with the CBCT, we can keep clearly see that this patient has the biological width. So we can make a strike knowing that we can do gingivectomy and with a simple gingivectomy without having to touch the bone, we can in 25 minutes create a new beautiful smile. So when we go and look at the cuts of the CBCT, we can see very, very well, tooth by tooth, that there is a distance between the CJ and the bone crest and the thickness of the bone crest. Actually, uh, with a group of uh, clinicians, with Awi Glukman, uh, with Christian Kochman, with uh, uh, <clears throat> Luis Bessa, and many more uh, around the globe, we're doing a multicentric uh, uh, study that will be very important. Uh, where we're doing these measurements, uh, we take the CBCT with the mouth open. So we try to measure the thickness of the gingiva, the thickness of the bone, and when and how we have to, do, to perform crown lengthening in patients with alter passive eruption. It will be a very nice uh, publication with a very heavy numbers of cases and with very scientific data and measurements. That will be probably out in 2021 because we were doing it uh, throughout uh, the past year and the beginning of 2020, but being all stock, we cannot do treatment. So it will be probably postponed to 2021-2022. So basically, uh, uh, the surgical procedure is quite simple. As you can see, we have to remove bone horizontally, vertically in the interproximal spaces. We want the soft tissue to basically sit very passively in the areas where we have the bone so that we just have to put the sutures to keep the flap into the place. We usually do this protocol. Uh, we start from the right side, we do the gingivectomy, we remove uh, the uh, color of tissue from one side and we can actually see on the picture on the upper right side that the, the big difference between uh, how much of the beautiful natural anatomy was hidden by the alter passive eruption. We take uh, uh, pictures and videos, uh, we do palatal anesthesia, we do a, a protocol with uh, the one device, so a computerized machine that delivers anesthesia from the palate, so the patient has full control of the lips, and we can actually evaluate how the patient exposes the teeth when smiles. And in this case, you can see that the emergence of the cement junction is just 
at the base of the upper lip, so it is a perfect smile. So this is it. Now we uh, expose uh, the teeth uh, right and left, uh, we open the flap, uh, we do the uh, osseous resective surgery, and uh, we get a wonderful result. So this is just uh, 35, 40 minutes after the procedure is completed. You can see that we open a window and now the teeth are reflecting the light, so it's a completely different clinical situation. And we match uh, the measurements before and after, and you can see that we perform just exactly what we expected to achieve from this kind of procedure. So it's a very simple, and uh, if planned well, it's a, it's a strike uh, because you can only have a good result. Well, this was actually uh, a more complicated case because uh, after the treatment uh, of alter passive eruption was completed, uh, we did lingual orthodontic, we did some restorative dentistry, bleaching, one implant on the upper bicuspid, but the end result is uh, on the uh, right side of the screen. You can see that when Irina smiles, now is a big screen showing light and reflecting the light very, very well like a mirror. So no more, no more pigmentation, no more gummy smile and a very happy, very happy patient. <clears throat> well, uh, as I said, uh, we did uh, as an individual, as a group, uh, many publications. Uh, this in 2008, uh, so 12 years ago, was uh, the first that we did uh, with my friend uh, Regina Santos Morales uh, from uh, Manila and uh, with Remo Benedetti, orthodontist from Genova, where we defined uh, the parameters of treatment of patients uh, with alter passive eruption. Well, alter passive eruption uh, uh, can have uh, different features because, like in this patient, we can see that. Uh, uh, we will find in the same patient uh, the subtype A and B within the two different arches. So it's not necessarily, uh, there is no rule for this kind of patient site. We can see that in the upper arch, we had the subtype A, so opening the flap, we had the biological width. And so this is before and this is after. And you can see how the gingiva reacts very, very positively to this treatment. This was the initial situation. This is shortly after the procedure was completed. And in the lower arch, actually, you can see that the teeth look short and square. So we expect this to be the anatomy, but it is not the real anatomy. The real anatomy is much different. You can see that after we already removed the color of ginger, in this case, we have a subtype B. So we need to perform osseous resective surgery. We remove the bone all along and we get a fantastic result because we go from very short teeth to a very beautiful and natural dentition. So imagine how much, uh, how much uh, light you create a mirror that reflects the light. And this patient that started like we see in the left side now is like in the right side and it's a beautiful natural smile. Well, sometimes we have, uh, uh, we see most of these cases uh, have good oral hygiene, but uh, if we have patient uh, with a, a poor oral hygiene, like in this case, it magnifies right away uh, the effect. Uh, alter passive eruption uh, is already a, a semi inflamed situation. So, if we add uh, biofilm, uh, plaque, and calculus on it, it becomes uh, uh, quite ugly to look at. So, in this case, uh, we performed oral hygiene instruction and uh, good oral hygiene measurements, but you can see that uh, after uh, oral hygiene was completed, there is still some kind of uh, nasty color and suffering in the soft tissue because some patients with thin biotype, like in this case, they really suffer uh, the, the fact that they have alter passive eruption. So the, the treatment was just uh, aggressive because we needed to create a good biologic width for this patient, give a little more than three millimeters in the interproximal space. You can see we create the spaces, we open the ramps, so we make sure that the gingiva sits very passively back into position. So you can see the before and after, before, is on top after it's in the bottom. Even the black triangles between the teeth are open so that we can create space for the gingiva to, healthy, uh, to healthily sit in the proper position. So this is only seven days after surgery. It's a long, it's a very old, it's one of the first uh, cases that I treated many, many years ago. I was still using six sutures, so you can imagine how old this, this case it was in 2000, so 20 years ago. 18 years after, the patient is still coming to the office uh, bringing the daughter for orthodontics. So we were able to take a picture in 2018. And you can see that 18 years after, the oral hygiene is perfect, the papillas are perfect, and everything we did is perfectly lasting in the time. 
Well, sometimes uh, uh, alter passive eruption is uh, mixed uh, with uh, prosthetics uh, uh, complications. So in this case, we have a pretty lady because we can, nobody can argue she's a pretty lady with a not so pretty smile. So she's coming to the office uh, requiring to have more balance, to have a smile that uh, uh, will not display gingiva and, and these parabolas that are one up, one down, it's like a roller coaster. There is no, no symmetry, no, no balance. This is not a, a pretty smile. So, well, of course, uh, uh, case documentation in these cases is very important. So we take uh, very good uh, intraoral and extraoral pictures. We try to focus uh, on the many problems that we have in this case, because we can see that we are lacking definitely uh, the interdental papillas also. So the fact that we will perform crown lengthening and we will bring the margins uh, a little bit higher, will recreate uh, that uh, biological parameters that can give us uh, a natural and beautiful uh, dentition again. So well, we always go through uh, this uh, process of studying the case, uh, doing the mock-up, uh, and you can see that with the mock-up, uh, we're already talking <clears throat> about a completely different uh, uh, situation. You can see that uh, the black triangles uh, all of a sudden disappear. We can see that the uh, scalloping of the gingiva has a more natural aspect. So we can foresee that uh, if we are doing uh, all the steps uh, very, very well, this is a multidisciplinary case. It involves perio, it involves endo, it involves pros, the uh, participants of the team will have to play for this game. <clears throat> so, after the mock-up is done, uh, we can actually print uh, a transparent uh, stent that will guide my uh, periodontal surgery. So I have actually a perfect indication of how much gingiva I have to cut and where I have to cut. So I can perform my incisions. The incisions as you can see, are very delicate, are just uh, uh, directed to where it's necessary to remove the gingiva. And you can see that we talk about uh, a combination of uh, subtype A and B, because we have areas uh, where we have the biological width and areas where we don't have the biological width. So what I have to do is to recreate it uh, to all the uh, abutments that we have. You can see in this case, I go, I push to up to three, four millimeters. So I will have a nice healing, I will have reattachment, we will have the perfect gingiva for the prostodontist to take the impression and carry on with the case. So you should not be afraid uh, when after the procedure the teeth look so long because also the gingiva will bounce back almost 90% uh, of what was uh, actually the initial removal of the tissue. But uh, this uh, will, uh, with the time, will uh, come back uh, and actually rejoin the area of the preparations and you can see uh, with the stent <coughs> the prostodontist uh, uses uh, what uh, the dental technician prepares so it, they have a very clear picture of how to restore uh, this teeth and look at the, at the pretty uh, aspect of the gingiva the gingiva is uh, firm is uh, is thick is healthy so you can put, put uh, the cords and take your impression and finalize this case in a very nice these are the beautifully uh, done uh, preparations uh, and uh, the impression. Francesco Di Tommaso uh, is a very good technician uh, from the south of Italy. We cooperate, uh, we work together in, in the office where I did this case uh, in Croatia with my friends. And he's an active member of the European Society of, of Cosmetic Dentistry as well. So this is the final restoration. You can see that uh, we have uh, uh, completely rebalanced uh, our situation and uh, the lady uh, now has a beautiful smile and uh, we have a beautiful smile because uh, we did a nice uh, teamwork between Italian and Croatian with Verena Nizic, with Mirna Skorin, and my friends from Kastav in Croatia where I go and help them to, to create beautiful smiles like this. <clears throat> Well, then uh, we enter in another, uh, in another feature of the alter passive eruption in a more complicated uh, area, which is uh, when we have a, a combined alter passive eruption and vertical maxillary excess. <clears throat> Again, Garber and Salama in 1996 classified three different degrees. Uh, degree one, when we have two to four millimeter of gingival display, two, uh, degree two, when we have four to eight millimeter of gingival display, and degree three, when we have more than eight millimeters. Well, when we have more than 80 millimeters, uh, uh, we enter in a field that is more 
close to closer to uh, maxillofacial surgery and combined maxillofacial, periodontic, and orthodontics, as we will see. But we have protocols for all of these patients. Well, one very nice case uh, was Lara. Lara uh, came in uh, initially because, as you can see on the right side, she had really a severe case of maxillary display. She was uh, displaying almost one centimeter of gingiva. The teeth were very short, very, very square. <clears throat> uh, we, and a pretty lady with these beautiful eyes needed uh, definitely to have a, a workup. And this is the, the masterpiece uh, of the multidisciplinary case because we needed to set up the case orthodontically, then to do the maxillofacial surgery to uh, actually replace uh, the maxilla and the mandible in the proper occlusion and position. And then the last uh, was the periodontist and the restorative dentist to uh, do the, the fine touches uh, to the masterpiece. <clears throat> So we started like this uh, with the orthodontic treatment done by Mauro Cozzani, that is actually the president of the Italian Society of Orthodontics. Mirko Raffaini, which is uh, probably the finest uh, maxillofacial surgeon that we have in Italy, played around uh, with this lady. You can see that he, he moved the maxilla, the mandible was broken in pieces, uh, and even the chin was cut and moved upward in a way to give a different profile and a different uh, face uh, uh, aspect to this patient. So this is uh, uh, the uh, profile of Lara at the beginning of treatment, and this is uh, uh, the, uh, pan the panorhythmocephalometry of Lara once uh, the maxillofacial surgery was already completed. You can see that the position of the chin is completely different, and she looks like a different girl. It's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful result. Now she has a new face. Now we have to take care of the smile. We look at the uh, uh, radiographs and we can clearly see that she has a, uh, she is a case of ultra passive eruption and is a subtype B for sure, both in the upper and lower arch. And we can see that we're very lucky because usually the subtype B carries also a very thick phenotype. So the gingiva is very thick, so we can really play with this soft tissue and get wonderful results, stability from day one. So now uh, we are ready to uh, enhance the second step of Lara's beauty. So we will give her also a beautiful smile. She has a good occlusion. Now uh, we have to give her a nice smile. We do crown lengthening. You can see that uh, we have to create uh, also in this case, uh, uh, alter passive eruption uh, type one subtype B. We have to create uh, biological wheel. But at the end of the procedure, you can see that if you do it right, this is with the stitches in place. You can barely see that I did a surgery in this case. I obviously put my knots in the palate so nobody can see. I use monocryl that is invisible, so it's transparent and nobody can see the stitches. But you can see that one hour before, the patient is one smile, one hour after is a perfect and beautiful smile. So this is the new situation, it's like this. You can see that it's like opening a window in a dark room, there is a lot of brightness coming in. You can see how much reflection these teeth give to the light. And as a periodontist, I want to focus on the quality of the soft tissue. Look at the gingiva, it's perfect, it's beautiful, it's healthy. It's the best you can expect from a periodontal health and from a periodontal healing. <clears throat> so Lara was so motivated that even if it doesn't really matter, she wanted to treat the alter passive eruption even in the lower arch. Same treatment, and on the left side we can see the before and after, and how beautiful it is when we can see the teeth also in the lower arch, not in the upper arch. Well, this is the final result. The final result is stunning. She is pretty, of course, and after the makeover, she is beautiful. So I think uh, uh, what we can do for these patients is really to change uh, their life, to make a life-changing uh, treatment that will make them really, really, really happy and. Uh, and healthy also because, of course, this is also a health treatment, not only a beauty treatment. Well, this is a beautiful case that uh, I borrowed by a very good friend, uh, Professor Eugenio Longo, and uh, this is the patient he treated uh, with also uh, vertical maxillary excess. You can see that uh, uh, is uh, called the Italian Wolverine. He does uh, these uh, uh, fancy pictures uh, with, uh, with the blades in his hand. He's a very skilled and talented uh, surgeon from Siena, Italy. 
Well, he studied this case uh, with the two probes. Uh, he performed uh, uh, combined crown lengthening and lip repositioning because uh, th this is another option so when the uh, vertical maxillary excess uh, is uh, the type two. So we have uh, uh, that margin of working and, and the muscles can be re replaced lower. Uh, combining these two treatments, uh, we can get a good result. So, it's a straight line incision in this case, the removal of this uh, uh, collar of uh, alveolar mucosa and the uh, exposure of the bone crest, uh, the removal of all the fibers, uh, the sutures, uh, and the crown lengthening on the teeth side and the lip repositioning give this result. So this is uh, about a few days uh, after the surgery was performed. And uh, one year down the line, you can see the nice healing of the new situation. And this is uh, the before. And this is actually the after. So it's a very nice and satisfactory result. Well, I want to show you a difficult case now. Difficult case because uh, uh, in this situation we have uh, uh, vertical maxillary excess. We need to do crown lengthening, we need to do lip repositioning, and we have an asymmetric gingival display. So the lip repositioning will not just be a straight line incision like the case uh, that my friend uh, uh, did before. But this will be a, a well-designed lip repositioning based, first of all, on the mock-up. So we put the mock-up that will help us to do the crown lengthening procedure. Then we decide, we design, we check, we do like a, like a digital smile design. We do, a, we do a, a, a digital smile design in the real uh, meaning of the smile because we are redesigning the smile in this, in this case, the position of the lips. We can see the occlusal plan is horizontal and the lips are a little bit slanted. So we will have to rebalance the incisions so that one of the incisions will be higher and one of the incisions will be lower. So the patient with the mock-up already looks so much better because the mock-up uh, uh, plugs all the little black triangles between the teeth. And in this case, you can see that I had to work on two different layers. So I have on the left side a higher line and in the right side a lower line so that my lip will be removed apically from the right side so that it will rebalance the smile that was a little bit slanted. So surprisingly enough, this is the very minimal traumatism of lip repositioning. It's not a very traumatic procedure. It's scary for the periodontist because they don't know anything about it once they learn to do it. It's a much simpler surgery than what we think. This is the patient after 24 hours. So we brought her back because we wanted to see no swelling no problems, and look at the wound 24 hours after surgery, the wound is almost healed already. So this is a very nice and delicate procedure. Before and after, patient is really, really happy. And uh, further down, this is the patient, how uh, she was very, very happy of this trip. <clears throat> Well, this is a case uh, I love because uh, uh, Francesca uh, was only a little girl when she came uh, to the office for the first time. Uh, as all young kids, uh, the oral hygiene was not perfect uh, and we needed uh, to remove the baby canine and to actually bring down the impacted canine to the right and to the left. She was only, I think, 12 or 13 years old when we did this. And uh, we completed uh, the orthodontic treatment, uh, and when she came back, uh, she was already 21 years old. We reevaluated the case, she's so pretty, but when she, we look very, very closely at this case, she is a case of ultra passive eruption, type 1, subtype B again. <clears throat> so, the measurement of the individual teeth look at the uh, central incisor or K lateral incisor, very, very short. The canine is absolutely very, very short as compared with what we can see in the radio. And again, we look at uh, uh, the procedure. Uh, in this case, we perform the uh, crown lengthening and the phrenectomy of the median frenum. And you can see before and after what a big difference, uh, how, how much enamel we expose and how beautiful this uh, smile becomes before and after. When she smiles, she shows the teeth completely and she doesn't show anymore that uh, anesthetic uh, uh, amount of pink. Well, now I will show you uh, a video so that you can see how this procedure uh, is done from the interview all the way uh, to the uh, final outcome of this case. Oh, 
He was caught in the middle of a desperate fight And she couldn't find how to push through The trees that whisper in the evening Carried away by a moonlight shadow Sing a song of sorrow and grieving Carried away by a moonlight shadow All she saw was a silhouette of a gun Far away on the other side, he was shot six times by a man on the run, and she couldn't find how to push through. I stay, I pray, see you in heaven far away. I stay, I pray, see you in heaven one day. Well, as you can see, this uh, video was edited by my children, by Arianna and Alessandro Rossi. Uh, my daughter was studying at New York Film Academy when, uh, when uh, I asked her to, to do this for me. And there is a reason why I'm talking about family, because uh, this uh, beautiful, pretty blonde lady that you have seen is uh, just uh, the mother of Francesca. And uh, the mother of Francesca and the Paolo, the other brother, uh, were in the same family and they all had alter passive eruption. Mm -hmm. That is why with the University of Rome and the University of Cagliari with Professor Andrea Piloni and with Professor Piras and Professor Brunelli in, in 2014, we did a combined study between the two universities uh, recalling all the patients uh, that were treated with the alter passive eruption. And we find the relationship of 65%. So 65% of the patients that had alter passive eruption had one sibling one relative in the family with the same condition. So it's nice uh, information for the dentist because when you have a patient of alter pass eruption, bring the family to the office and you'll find a lot of new patients to treat in your practice. Well, this is the new smile of both mother and daughter. So a beautiful result. So we really uh, brightened uh, the smile uh, of this family and was a very nice uh, and satisfactory result for everyone. So in conclusion, so in conclusion, uh, what we have to do <coughs> is to do a very accurate smile analysis, uh, do evaluation of clinical and anatomical proportions, mock-up and case planning, surgery, and then re-evaluation. 
Nowadays, uh, my friend Eugenio Longo and uh, the group of researchers in the University of Genova, they did a very nice publication uh, last year in the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry, <coughs> doing uh, uh, digital scanning of cases of alter passive eruption and uh, planning with a stereolithographic model and a surgical stand. But we will present uh, these uh, cases in the international meeting of the Italian Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry next October, if it will go through. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Omid for hosting me here, but also uh, the people that are working behind the scenes, my friend Regina Santos Morales uh, from UPenn and, and from Manila, Philippines, uh, my partner Alessandro Conti, and our beloved dental technician Davide Bertazzo for the beautiful restoration that he has done for our patients in this, uh, in this case. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and uh, I hope to see you in uh, my Facebook groups at Arbonne Layer and Continuing Education in Dentistry. I invite actually Omi to publish uh, this video and others in uh, Continuing Education in Dentistry that has 2,000 participants, uh, all uh, qualified uh, dentists from all over the world, and I'm sure they will appreciate uh, this lecture and also the one of the other lecturers that you invited to lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roberto, for this comprehensive presentation on crown lengthening, aesthetic approaches, and uh, most importantly, multidisciplinary approach, which is one of the things that all the dentists want to deal with gummy smile should take into consideration because we should see the smile as a, as a we can say, as a package. <laughs> so we cannot just go only for exactly. the <clears throat> tooth. Sometimes we have problems no. with lips, sometimes we have orthodontics, sometimes maxillofacial. So everything should be taken into the consideration. So I have some questions regarding Absolutely. the cases and presentation. First of all, uh, when you're talking about type, uh, type one, uh, altered passive eruption subgroup A, or better say type A sub, subgroup one, um, when, we are, when, we, when we decide to go with only soft tissue surgery and gingivectomy. Sometimes when we do the gingivectomy, we see that the bone is, for some, in some areas we have bone one and a half millimeter from the CEJ, in some areas it's about two millimeters from CEJ. And regarding the classification, we decide to do only soft tissue surgery. But because the bony area is not exactly in a equi equi equal way in all teeth, what's the reference for us to do the bone surgery in those cases? Should we do it or no? Well, in the, in the subtype A, we cannot uh, say we really do a, a osteostectomy. We can do an osteoplasty. So if you find... Uh, uh, that uh, some of the teeth have minor uh, uh, prob issues with the, with, the, with the biological width, mm -hmm. you can use the curette and you can use uh, uh, the tunneling knife, you can use small instruments and reshape uh, the, the ridge without having to address uh, an osteoporosective surgery uh, as it's supposed to be. Uh, so we define that as a osteoplasty versus uh, ostectomy. So, we just do minor remodeling and, and polishing uh, of the bony surface and the root surface uh, rather than an aggressive uh, oste ostectomy with removal of the bonals in the interproximal area. So if you want to do the ostectomy, your number is three millimeters, right? To have three millimeters of space every uh, When you do the ostectomy, you have to remove uh, up to three, sometimes four millimeters, depending on on, on the bony, on the bony uh, aspect that you find, because sometimes uh, uh, patients with alter passive rupture of type B, uh, they are really thick bony ledges. So you really have to remove uh, up to two millimeters horizontally and up to three, four millimeter vertically, because the tendency uh, of these patients is to relapse. Mm -hmm. So if you don't remove enough bone within one year, you'll find the patient like he did not do any surgery, so you have to do it again. So I always suggest uh, uh, my students to be uh, a little bit aggressive because aggressiveness uh, uh, pays you in terms of future stability. Because if you're shy with your, with your osseous resective surgery, it's very likely that you get a bounce back. Yeah, and um, 
And Roberto, in the cases that we have high frenum pool, especially between two central incisors, yes. do you, do you, do yes, we combine phrenectomy and, uh, and crown lengthening. So you can do it simultaneously as long as the frenum is not uh, hampering your flap surgery. If the frenum can uh, interfere with your flap surgery, use the phrenectomy first, and after uh, six, six weeks, you can do the crown lengthening. Crown lengthening. And also you mentioned about the other options like lip repositioning. Um, especially in one case that um, there was uneven uh, lip mobility of the patient. So in one side, you did mm -hmm. more yeah. you had more extension. So um, do you find any risk in such procedure when we are doing uneven lip repositioning? So maybe at the end of the surgery, the, when the patient smiles, the symmetry of the smile going to be not the way that we want it to be? No. No, because if the planning was done correctly, you cannot make such a mistake. <laughs> if you make such a mistake, you will have to do it again. So, you know, you just have to let it heal. And, uh, and then once you have the healing, you have to do the correction. But uh, that is why we do the measurements before, because we want to make sure uh, to see uh, you put you put the, the lips uh, and the midline uh, on on a plane, and you really have to measure how much you have to tilt uh, your lip uh, to the right and to the left, and and that will define the the position where you will put the muscle, so that the lip uh, will stay as exactly where it want, where you want it to be. Yeah, and um, it is much simpler than what it looks. It looks complicated in uh, in uh, in the pictures, but in reality is much easier than what you think. Exactly. Because it's just a muscle that is very dynamic. So it's not a muscle that is not going to move because it's going to stretch every day when the people chew, when the people smile. So uh, it's, uh, it's quite easy to, to handle. It's not, it's not difficult. If you put it in a position that is, is too low and it's not going to move, if the patient does uh, some, some kind of training, it can bring back the lip where it was before you did the surgery. So yeah. it's, it's quite easy. And, and regarding lip repositioning, some, some practitioners uh, tend to just remove the epithelial layer under the lip. And some people tend to yes. also release the fibers of the muscle. So as I, as I noticed yes. in your presentation... Well, you, you better remove the, all the fibers because uh, uh, otherwise, again, it's a, it's a strong muscle. If you leave there some fibers, it will just uh, go back to where, where it was before. It so will it's relax. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a very it's a very strong muscle. So even if the surgery is very delicate, uh, we have actually no uh, uh, no guarantee that uh, uh, with the exercise the patient will not relapse mm -hmm. because it's like uh, when we do coronary advanced flap and we move uh, apically the mucogingival line, we have seen that throughout the, the years, after one or two years, uh, the, the mucogingival line recessed to the original position. So there is a tendency of the nature to go back to what it used to be. Yeah, exactly. And um, I, the patient have to be also uh, somehow uh, monitored, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, for these patients, we combine in this case, uh, uh, lip repositioning and some Botox injection because the Botox will try to keep uh, uh, the muscle pool uh, as low as possible. Yeah, I, I, exactly. That was my, I, I wanted to say that my final point. So you mentioned it a bit. I wanted to mention about the Botox treatment in a uh, gummy smile patient, especially in uh, class two and class three maxillary excess, or in the cases that they have very hypermobile lips. So do you, do you prefer to go with Botox or lip repositioning or uh, you have any specific criteria for choosing between these, te these two techniques? Well, sometimes uh, the lip repositioning is the first step and the Botox, uh, I would say that is the monitoring step. So you, if you see that there is a tendency to relapse, uh, some Botox injection will help uh, uh, to cool down the lip and to stay where you want it to be. And I'm very lucky that I have a, a very good uh, uh, aesthetic surgeon in the office who does uh, these procedures for me. And uh, if I have these problems, I pass it on to him. Mm -hmm. 
I got it because because it's one of the things that uh, usually people ask, and um, it's actually a very reversible treatment, Botox. So patients sometimes well, you have to uh, to have an open mind when you do these kind of things uh, because when you're dealing with uh, with the muscle, uh, the muscle uh, is a muscle, so it's yeah. used to to pull, and uh, the tendency will always be to to try to go back back to, to where it was. Uh, so no matter what you did, uh, I mean, the, the strength of the muscle is stronger than, than your stitches. And, uh, and, uh, and in the end, if you're not very careful, uh, it's very easy to get relapses in things like this. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Roberto, I have to say- Monitoring, monitoring is always uh, the key of the, the game. If you, if you keep your patients uh, tightly monitorized, uh, you can you can make your result last for 20 years if you lose your patients uh, when they come back you don't know what they did uh, and how they behaved when they're not in the office so that's that's another risk so as part of the treatment the maintenance phase is very important exactly in, like like in all treatments in perio and implant field maintenance always is the key so with that absolutely because uh, when we finish when we finish uh, the treatment, uh, I always tell them that this is the end of the active treatment. Mm -hmm. And now the passive treatment starts, which is monitoring. So if you want to maintain uh, what we suffered so many months to get, uh, you have to come back every four to six months. And, and, and then if I can monitor the situation, if something is starting to change, I can fix it before it becomes a change that will require major changes. So the monitoring phase is, is a very important uh, part of our treatment plans. Exactly. Well, with that said, uh, Roberto, again, I truly wanted to appreciate your time, your beautiful, demonstrated, comprehensive presentation on static crown lengthening and gummy smile procedure with multidisciplinary approach. I truly enjoyed it. I'm pretty sure all the audience did. And again, thank you so much. And really looking forward to see you very soon after this COVID-19 gets over. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, I hope you stay, stay safe and to have to see you around when, when everything will open up to normal life again. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, my friend. Really enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Thank you. <clears throat>